Now this morning, it's very important. We've been in our marriage, uh, family, sex, and singles, part four. And it, as we move into this study, I, I've tried to look at it a couple of different ways. I've tried to do it in a way like we're going to get on a little uh, lake cruiser, a little dinner cruiser, and just kind of ease through the waters with nice little meals and things. But today, I've changed the approach a little bit on this. Today, uh, I guess what I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of a good analogy but I would think that if it was a cleanup day or something at home, I don't know what you would wear that day or if you wanted to put your scarf on or your mops or your buckets. Guys, I'm thinking maybe if you just kind of jump up in your bulldozer, we're going to plow through some, some doctrinal things today that are very important. So I'm giving you some meat and potatoes today. So we're not going to snack. We're not going to hors d'oeuvres. So I want to move kind of plow through this. And so uh, thank God that uh, Johanny and the praise team had some really upbeat music and exciting because it got your blood pumping this morning. Amen. So as we dive into this series, part four of marriage, family, sex, and singles, I'm pretty confident by now that, uh, you know, we can no longer assume that people in our culture understand what the proper definition of marriage in the family is. Have you noticed a drastic shift at all levels, corporately, through the neighborhoods, around the world? Now, I was going to pull out a couple articles from Time Magazine and a couple other mainstream uh, uh, current affair events to share with you. I thought, no, they already know this. They know what's going on. You're astute. You're smart. I can see by looking at you, you have your smart face on today. So be proud of yourselves. Okay, strap it on because it's in part important that we really grasp this today. Um, it's kind of a sad commentary on the impact of special interest groups lately. And you know who they are as you read and listen to the daily news or watch the TV news. But I believe that God's original design for marriage and family has withstood these kind of attacks before. This is not the first time that the Bible and that God and marriage and family has had to uh, endure assaults and attacks. And what I'll tell you is, is some very good news today that God's word has stood the eternal test of time because the word of God is still here. And the Christians of God are still here and the church of God is still here. And so what that tells me is, hey, on our watch, we need to stand firm. We need to be strong in the Lord in the power of his might and state what we believe and why we are of a biblical worldview. And we don't need to riot. We don't need to pick it. That's not what we do. That's not how God's people do it. But we are to be ready in season and out. We're always to be ready to give a testimony of the faith that is within us. Because if you're living for God and you're working for God and you're reading and studying for God, you can best believe that God can depend on you to send lost people to you. If you don't know what you believe or if you don't know why you believe something, then that's an area of confusion and you don't want to be part of that group. You want to be part of the group that has studied to show thyself an approved workman unto God, rightly being able to divide the truth so God can depend on you. Now, that's the goal. That's the goal for every one of us as Christians is to be strong in the word, create that relationship through prayer and intimacy, fellowship with the house of God. So when we go back to the world that we are making an impact for the glory of God. Amen. You agree with that this morning? So back to the Bible we go. And I think it's important when people say, well, what is marriage? Uh, is that biblically defined? What is the biblical definition of a family? So in this brief series on marriage, family, sex, and singles, we're taking up these questions. And through the Bible, I want you to know what God says about these issues. What's the gender roles of a man and a woman? How's that supposed to happen? What did the feministic movement do to hinder some of this work that God's laid down? Now, it has taken its toll on a lot of culture. And there's a lot of folks that don't understand what their role is as a man and a leader in the family. And what's my role as a woman? How far can I go before I get in trouble with God? What can I say and what can I not say that will help benefit my family? So the word of God has a lot to say about that this morning. The foundation must be set on gender 
roles from a biblical worldview. And I want you to remember that we maintain a biblical worldview against the culture today. We must stand our ground. Those that embrace Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, those that are men and women of the Bible, we must know the Word of God, hide it in our hearts that we would not sin against Him, and be ready when God needs us to step up. Do you agree with that? I mean, that's what God is when He's thinking about dependable Christians that He can depend on you when He sends somebody to your life that you're not going to confuse them anymore, but you are the one that God has specifically said they will give them the truth. And they will let them know that I'm the way. And that's what we want to do today. So as we dive back to the word of God. Now, I think it's important to understand some of you that may not know that may not be grounded in the word of God. Why do we use the Bible? Why do we go back to the Bible? Why is the Bible such a big deal? Now, some people mock our Bible. They say, oh, that's no different than Spider-Man or the Koran or all these things. But I think you need to know why that we go back to the Word of God. Well, first and foremost, it's the inspiration of Scripture. What does that mean? Well, we accept the Bible as the inspired Word of God. That means God breathed. Now, people always say, well, yeah, a bunch of men wrote that. And, you know, and I don't know, look, if you take that approach, then you can't believe any documentation that you've ever been to school with. If you take that approach that, well, men wrote it, well, men write everything. But these men are men inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And 40 authors over 15 years prophesied in one half, fulfilled it in the other half, and there were no disputes in the original manuscripts of the Word. People can argue about translations all they want, but remember this. We go back to the original manuscripts that we have on record, and that is the absolute truth of God without error. It is not a lie. So being able to defend that is very critical. And so we accept the Bible as the inspired Word of God, and the writers were inspired, moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1.21, if you want to go back and read it later, you can. And the writings are inspired as if breathed or spoken by God himself. 2 Timothy 3.16 is another famous passage that we have, that God's Word is inspired, it's inerrant, it's infallible. So the Bible is therefore useful as a guide to salvation through faith in Christ and sufficient for doctrine, correction, moral, and ethical instructions. Inspiration is God-breathed, and that's why we trust the Word of God that inspired men to write it. Number two, it's the authority of the Scripture. If you don't believe that the Bible is the sole authority from God, then we've got an issue. We've got a problem. So what does that mean, Pastor, the authority of Scripture? Well, God has all authority, and we accept the Bible as the primary authority which God communicates to us what God wants us to believe and to do. God didn't leave us as orphans. God said, look, I'm going to inspire some men. I'm going to tell you what my expectation is of you. And then I simply ask that as your holy father, that you honor that. Now, that's where we are in life. So if you don't follow the Bible, then you're following something that was not God-breathed, that was not inspired. Every Christian author ought to point you back to one book. If you ever master any book, it should be this book. You don't need 3,000 books on your shelf. You need one book. You need the Bible. If you commit your life to reading the Bible, studying the Bible, treasure this. Paul in prison said, send me my parchments. Why? he wanted the inspired word and isn't incredible that 13 of the epistles were written by the apostle paul was he just a holy man no listen paul was a bounty hunter paul was out hunting christians and dragging them in the streets and killing them and what that means simply is that god can use anybody he can use murderers he can use drunkards you know we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of god and god uses us So the New Testament clarifies 
and sometimes supersedes the Old Testament guidance on faith and life. And the primary purpose of the Bible in its message is about salvation. That it is the primary sphere of God's authority. It is a sufficient guide to tell us how we are given eternal life with God and how we should respond to that great gift. Grace on top of grace. You know, our sins were forgiven. We ought to be the happiest people on the planet. We know something that the world doesn't. We are born again, we are saved, and it's as if we've never sinned. The beauty of being a Christian is that we get to start over whenever you need to. Now, we don't use it as a revolving door of sin, but we have an advocate through Jesus Christ who paid the penalty for our sins, past, present, and future. So those who believe the biblical revelation about God's grace and Jesus Christ, God's Son, enjoy the salvation that he has given through his sacrificial death. Unbelievers do not. Unbelievers do not understand spiritual things because it's only through the Holy Spirit that they are illuminated about the things of God. That's why the cross is foolishness to the world. They say, that's ridiculous. What are you talking about? Ax heads floating, donkeys talking, seas parting. Ah, that's fairy tale. Well, you know what? That's fine if people want to say that. But look, I believe in everything that God said in his holy word. This book is still the number one best seller on the planet Earth. And I've tested the scriptures and I've tested God. And I've, I've known through trials and tribulations and desperate times of great need that God came through for me. God always comes through. Now, it may not be my way, but I promise you, that the author and finisher of my faith is going to do exceedingly far above all that we ask or think. Now, I didn't make that up. That's Ephesians 3.20. And he tells us that. So the authority of Scripture is absolutely something that we hang on to, that it is reliable. It is God-breathed and God-inspired. The Bible commands and principles regarding the way that we ought to live. So we spend our lives trying to learn Look, if I told you this book will tell you exactly how to get to Alaska on foot, you ought to follow it, especially if someone's already been there. Right? There's not always times in life that you can pull over to a gas station and ask for directions. I mean, there's just things that God says, look, if you'll just do them, I want you to have the best life possible. I want you to have the joy of life. I want you to experience things you never dream of. But the problem is we really don't listen to God. We listen to ourselves, our own humanity. And that's when we get in trouble, when we drift away from him. And then thirdly, I want you to see the reliability of the scripture. The scriptures are a trustworthy guide for our relationship with God and with other humans. They give, give us truth about faith, worship, salvation, morals, and ethics. You see, if you remove God from the equation, if you remove all morality from a supernatural created being, what's left? Your opinion and mine. And so who's right? I'll tell you who's right, the one who has all the authority and power. And that's why kings used to get in so much trouble, because they had the highest authority in the land. And if they didn't like you, they'd say, off with his head. They'd throw you in prison. There was no grace and mercy. If the king liked you, you were in good standing, but the king didn't like you, you were done. And so if you take God and you remove him, and there is no higher power, there is no God, the only thing is left is humanity to argue what is right. It wouldn't matter then whether you were Adolf Hitler or Mother Teresa, because who's right? Mother Teresa said it's not right to kill people, and Hitler says, oh yeah, I believe it is. So we go to the higher power, and what's the higher power? Well, he's found in the Bible, and his name is I Am. He's the great and all-powerful God, the one true God. The God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all promise, hope, grace, peace, mercy, and love. That God is in sovereign power over the world. Well, pastor, if that's true, then why is life so bad? Well, life's so bad because we are sinful people. There's sinful people on the planet. Now, if you read the book, you would realize there's nothing wrong in that book. Anton LaVey was a satanic priest 
And he used to make fun of it all the time and say, yeah, they eat blood and drink blood and all these different types of things. But he always took the Bible out of the context. And so if you don't commit your life to reading, studying, and learning the book, you don't have to master it, but you ought to read it. It's about your Savior. It's about how to live life. It's about how to raise your children. It's about how to stay married. If you want to be successful and you want to have a successful marriage, a successful family, and you want to be successful in the eyes of God, then simply do what God asks you to do. Now, it sounds simple, doesn't it? Easy peasy, right? You soon find out there's a problem. You. You're the problem. I'm the problem. Humans are the problem. Pride says no. No, right? It starts at the age of two. Mine. Mine. Give me. I take mine, right? And it just gets worse. So here we are at 30, 40, and 50. Mine. You just got bigger toys. My house, my car, my vacation, my trips, my life, my money, my retirement, my, my, my. My, my, my. And then we hear about this God who gives it away. You see, we go back to the Bible because it's God's word. And the Bible defines family. How do you define family? What makes a family? How do you know you're a family? Can you explain your family? The Bible defines family in a narrow sense as the union of one man and one woman in holy matrimony, which is normally blessed with one or several natural or adopted children. In a broad sense, this family also includes any other persons related by blood, i.e. the extended family. In the book of Genesis, we read that God in the beginning created first a man and his name was Adam to exercise dominion over all of his creation and subsequently a woman. Her name was Eve, and Eve was created from the side of man. Now, Eve was a suitable helper, as recorded in Genesis 2, 18 and 20. Then the inspired writer remarks, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's Genesis 2, 4. The one flesh is sexual intercourse. It, the marriage is consummated through having sex. We said the word sex in church. Sex is created by God. Sex is not bad. Sex is not ugly. God designed it. When God created and designed everything, he said it's good. And when he created you, he threw an extra. He said it's very good. And so you were wonderfully and fearfully made in the image of God. Listen, regardless of what happens to you, what has happened to you, you have to know you're not who you think you are. You're who God says you are circumstances don't define you they just help to shape you into the man and woman that you are today that's what a family is biblically and that verse sets forth the biblical pattern instituted by God at the very beginning one man is united to one woman in holy matrimony and the two form one new natural family and so that's important to understand how he planned now how is he planning to get other humans here class sex that's how other human beings are here now it was in the in the guidelines of marriage god is very specific if you young folks want to know when it's right to have sex it's when you're married anything outside of that whether it happened to you or whether it happened through you you know those were what we call fornication and things that happened were wrong and people battle those things. Sometimes it's a lot of tough issues that happen inside of homes because of the fall in the garden. And that fall infected everything. Everything. So, we make this turn, and when we go back to the original design, well, Pastor, all these things have happened. Where do I begin? Well, you begin right where you are. You begin in the relationship that you're in. You begin today right where you are. 
The beauty of being a born again believer is that God forgives us of all the past. The past doesn't have to hurt us. The past doesn't have to haunt us. If anything, we should learn from the past and we should be better people. And only, only, only through the power of the Holy Spirit are we ever successfully wed to our spouses and do we raise godly families. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the very first step of all of this marriage, family, sex and singles is this. If you don't have a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, well, that's where I'm just going to say you need to begin. Everything begins with God. If you get past those first four words in Genesis, in the beginning God, and you read the rest of it in that context, then you won't have a problem with this book. But you can't rip out pages just because you disagree with it. Do you understand that? It's important that we understand that. We who are Christians believe that the fullest understanding of God's will for marriage can be derived from a careful examination of scriptural teachings. So it is incumbent upon the church to educate both itself and the larger culture regarding the full breadth and depth of God's intentions for marriage. Now, I don't believe I was a gobba goo and then I created you. Okay, I just don't believe that. I, I, I'm sorry. I believe intelligent design. I believe in one God, one holy creator, one holy heavenly father. I believe in Jesus Christ, his son, begotten, not made. That means he always existed. Don't take me there because I don't know how to explain all that. When you get to glory, we'll sit down and we'll talk to Jesus about all of it. We'll have plenty of time in eternity. But I will tell you, all the archaeological discoveries, all the things that happened, everybody wants to have proof. But I'm telling you, Jesus came to earth many years ago. He was the living proof and they still rejected him. They saw miracles. They rejected him. He raised the dead. They rejected him. He made blind people see. They rejected him. He made the lame to walk. They rejected him. Do you understand that? So it isn't a matter of proving to anybody. Why? Because God set it up that the just shall live by faith. So I don't have to prove it. You can't get into heaven without making a decision whether you believe that Jesus Christ was the real son of God or he was not. I didn't set it up that way. God did. And so I don't argue with that. I believe by faith. I believe that. I believe that God is working in me. And so that was the biblical uh, definition of the family. Now, what is marriage? Well, marriage is a covenant, a sacred bond between a man and a woman instituted by and publicly entered into before God and normally consummated by sexual intercourse. God's plan for the marriage covenant involves at least the following five vital principles. Now, Sex, again, is permitted only within the marriage. And as God originally designed it, it was instituted in that holy matrimony between a man and a woman, according to the Holy Scriptures. What is marriage? This is a great reminder. You may say, well, I've been married for a while and I'm all good with that. Well, listen, you need to be reminded what marriage does for you and why God instituted the marriage so that you will hold it sacred. Okay? She's a lot more than just your ball and chain. And he's a lot more than just your old man. Okay, before God, this is serious. And you young people, you do want to get married. If you grew up in a family, typically it's amazing to me that that concept is embedded deeply in all of us. And even those that don't know God, that didn't get their design from the Bible, that didn't get it from God, isn't it amazing that they all want to be married? That blows my mind. And if you want to hear something else, those people that have to walk through divorce, which is difficult and challenging, you may not have asked to do that. You may not have wanted to do that, but you found yourself going through that. Isn't it amazing that over 90% always remarry so there's something very special about marriage and our job is to go back to the book and how do we defend that what's my role pastor how do I do that I feel like I've messed up so much well you're not alone in that I didn't have a clue how to do it when I got saved at 25 I just started building a relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit I said look I don't know how to do this God I don't know how to love I don't know how to be that man I, I didn't have it but God has systematically, as he began that work in me, began to teach me where, where? Through the word. So I learned so much from the Bible and what God tells me. And then I try to do that the best of my ability. Do I fall short? Yes. 
At times do I blow it? Yes. But I don't get a PhD in it. I'm not trying to get a master's degree in messing up. You follow me? And if you don't have a working, vital relationship with the Holy Spirit, you are on the enemy's top 12 list. Because you have no defense. You have no defense. You don't even know when the enemy's in there. You see, at least with the smoke detector, if you stick a battery in it, when there's smoke in the house, a sound goes off, right? Everybody have a smoke detector in your home? I'll call a fire marshal on you if you don't. Okay? Well, you depend on that, that if there's a fire and you're sleeping, that that scream goes off. Well, similarly the same way, the Holy Spirit is a smoke detector. So you cultivate the relationship with the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, then I know when sin's in the camp. I know something's wrong. It don't smell right. It isn't right, right? Because the Holy Spirit's saying, hey, pay attention here. This isn't good. Bobby, you need to go this way. Don't go up into that group right now. Don't go talk to them right now. And he's probably saved my life a million times out on the streets of Lakeland and around the city and feeding through the years. But I learned to listen to the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I'm not always perfect with that, but I make it a goal of my life that I will cultivate that relationship. If you want to be successful in the eyes of God, you cannot do it apart from the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. Listen, your knowledge doesn't mean squat to God if you don't have any application through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. You can be the smartest person on this planet and that don't mean anything if you don't do one thing for God. If you don't follow him in one step of obedience, all you are is a puffed up Christian. And at that, a Pharisee at best, right? So God is trying to say, look, I'm not, I'm not, I want you to grow and learn, but I'm not about you knowing all the Bible answers and you don't live for me. There's no love in you. There's no humility in you. There's no really grace in you. You know, you just have biblical knowledge. You don't want to do that, right? I always get a kick out of this. Those people that know and claim to know God the best, well, they don't ever seem to be very humble. They seem to be almost arrogant. They seem to kind of be full of themselves because they want to throw out knowledge at you. And that does not attract God, by the way, because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, they all threw out knowledge. God is not impressed. A, you're not smarter than God. B, the Bible says knowledge puffs up. So if a little kid had nothing but the knowledge of salvation and he learned to live within that, he's going to be 10 times better than anybody who spent 40 or 50 years reading the Bible. So it's not just about that, guys. You are called upon to live like Jesus. Dramatic pause. That's what he's saying. Right? Someone once said, well, I don't care how much you know till I know how much you care. You see the difference? It's important. The permanence of marriage, marriage is intended to be permanent. It was established by God at Mark, uh, Matthew 19, 6, Mark 10, 9. Marriage represents that serious commitment that we should not be entered into lightly or unadvisedly. Marriage is not a dating plan. You're not just giving it a shot like Zsa Zsa Gabor. You know that it was, I stopped counting after five or six. You know, that's not what it is. I mean, it's just not. It's a covenant. And if you go back and you study the covenant, then you'll understand that they sealed a covenant by blood. And the oath was in the old days in the Middle East was may one of us die before this covenant is broken. And they would cut and seal it with blood. Now that's serious. I haven't done a wedding yet in 31 years where they were cutting their wrist and taking blood oaths and wrapping them together and, and making covenants of that agreement. You know, you don't see that. You know, it just don't happen in our culture because we're just so much better than everybody else in the world. The sacredness of marriage. Marriage is not merely a human agreement between two consenting individuals. It's a civil union. It's a covenant relationship before and under God. Listen, through 31 years, Yvette and I, 32 years of marriage, you're always going to be tempted by other things. You're going to get into arguments. You're going to feel like quitting. You're going to feel like giving up. I mean, every Monday, I'm already going to be a used car salesman. I don't want to be a preacher anymore. I don't want to talk about this stuff. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that go on in your life. But why do you do it? Why do you hang in there? Because you made a covenant to God. Just because she or he is not doing what you want them to do, well, you didn't enter into it. What if marriage was designed to teach you holiness and not happiness?
It's not about your happiness. It's about living faithfully to God the way God asks us to live. To live. And so what happens is they, they made a decree, Moses, because guys were getting divorced because they burnt the pot roast. Uh, or because they didn't wear the right earrings. Uh, they started walking crooked. Uh, they weren't at the market on time. I mean, they made a thousand excuses why they were divorcing. And he said, you know, you fools, what are you doing? That's the reason he wrote that. The only reason he put that in there for adultery was because of what they were doing. And what he was saying was, even if someone does commit that, that doesn't mean because you can that you should. Do you understand that? Well, I can toss you out now. And so when I think about it, as we move into sexuality, you need to understand that there are those that have maybe commit spiritual adultery. There are those physical adultery. Watch this. But if you are a man or a woman and you withhold sexual relations from your spouse, whether it's control or manipulation, you are as guilty as the person who committed adultery. Yeah, you know why? Because the woman was a gift to the man, the man a gift to the woman. And it says in the Bible that you shouldn't refrain from sexuality unless you are fasting and praying. I don't know many people that fast and pray for a year. Now maybe a Monday you do, then there would be 52 times during that year that you would just not have intimate relations. But the Bible also says when you finish, go get busy. Now, I paraphrase a little bit, but he said, get back to it. Why? Oh, <laughs> because it's necessary to cultivate the marriage relationship. Sex was designed to procreate. It was also for the intimacy in, in the marriage. Now, what if you're single? Oh, I got you on the list. But I want you to understand how God designed it. Now, look, the home changed. It used to be the man would go out and earn the bread and mama would take care of the household. That used to be, that's how my grandmother and grandfathers did it. The man used to go out. Well, some of the damage of the feministic movement is now the woman isn't home that much anymore. She's going out to work too. So most of the time they, we push kids off into daycare centers. You know, and look, that's your choice how you want to do that. I'm just telling you what the original design of God is. It doesn't mean that you're doomed because you did it a certain way. Don't hear me to say that. But you need to understand the gender roles of a man and a woman as husband and wife. And you need to know that that is the parameters that we stay with. So it is the sacredness of marriage. It's the intimacy of marriage. And I covered that. The mutuality of marriage. The, the marriage is a relationship of free, self-giving one human being to another. Ephesians 5, 25 through 30. The marriage partners are to be the first and foremost concerned about the well-being of each other. Listen to me. It's very important you get this. You started off loving each other. You started off a commitment together. And then when kids come along, then typically the woman's attention is given more to the kids. And there's a fade off. There's time and energy and all these things that happen. And typically the guy can be what is called leftovers. Okay, so she's like, I'm exhausted. I've been talking baby talk all day. I've been home. I've been doing all these things. And they got nothing left for their husbands at the end of the day. Now, guys, don't be offended by the way God set this up. I'm not meddling in your life. I'm just telling you that you've got to go back to the blueprints to see how you're doing. That's all. I mean, it's your life. And you can live it how you want to live it. And you can do what you want to do. And you can only believe half the book if you want to. But I believe every jot and tittle of this book from Genesis to Revelation 21, all the way to the very end of that book. And I try my best to move in that direction. I'm not successful with 32 years because I have some sort of a great marriage, man. I'm successful because the Bible says that a three-chord strand is not easily broken. And with Christ being in the center of my marriage relationship in my family, when I'm out there being a bozo or I'm out there messing up or my wife is messing up, you know what? There's God saying, hey, both of you need to straighten your rumps out, get back in here and start working on this relationship. Because when you get together and you work on the relationship, now you're a benefit to the family. But if you're divided and the husband's this way and the wife's that way, then you can best believe that your family is going to be chaotic and schizophrenic. Why? Because you are modeling to your children what marriage looks like. That's what it is. 
So the Bible tells us what that is. In the exclusivity of marriage, marriage is not only permanent, sacred, intimate, and mutual, it's exclusive. That means that no other human relationship must interfere with the marriage commitment between husband and wife. For this reason, Jesus treated sexual immorality of a married person, including even a husband's lustful thoughts or a wife's, with utmost seriousness, and he wrote about it in Matthew 5, 28, chapter 19, 9, for the same reason, premarital sex is also illegitimate. The culture says, let's go find out if we're compatible. And they shack up together. And God said, that's not how I set that up. What happens is this. You've probably already put a curse on your relationship because you're doing something outside of the will of God. God doesn't wink at my sin and your sin. God doesn't bless us not doing the things properly. God blesses us doing it right. That's what God blesses. Now, I know you probably may not have had the godly parents and those things, but, but look, remember I told you, begin where you are today. Where are you? Some of you young ladies that want to get married, you better set your standard pretty high. I mean, good Christian men are getting real slim pickings out there. So you want to live yourself in a way that if guys look, I got a, I got a man for you, okay? But you need to start living the godly life so that God can pull one of those godly men. And I don't care if it's from China or around the world, but he will bring that man to you if you're being faithful and obedient in those areas of your life, right? God wants the best for you. He just does. So marriage, you know, it's important to understand. In that passage in Ephesians 5, it says this. And remember we said it's, the word was subject to. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Did you catch that? He wasn't saying that you just submit and be a dog. It's not a dictatorship. But he's saying, ladies, I need you to submit to your man as you do to Christ. What you do for Christ Remember, Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all these things. What he's saying is, look, you may have a bonehead for a husband. But if you learn to love him like Christ, then you're not going to have a problem with that. Does he come with flaws? Yes. Does he have issues? Yes. Do you? Yes. 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 You do. I always laugh all the time. I, 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 I tell my wife, you know, I'm just like my chiropractor said, I'm jacked up. But God, watch this. If you allow God the rightful place in your heart and your life, you keep him, somebody needs to keep him in your marriage. Somebody. If neither one of you are going to keep God in your marriage, well, it's just a matter of time. Well, preacher, I know people that get married. Yeah, but they may have gotten married and they may have stayed married. But listen, my uncle was married 50 years, but my uncle was a businessman and my uncle rarely ever was intimate with, with my aunt, but he went out and did his thing on the business world. So he was fine, but he could tell people he was married 50 years and that man was no more faithful than the devil. You see what I'm saying? So what do you want? You want quality or you want quantity? You want righteousness, right? So what he's saying is wives, love your husband as you love me by honoring Christ right you're honoring your husband you're doing it for Jesus lady is what I'm telling you. you you don't have to do it for him he may never get it but do it for Jesus because he's watching you and he commanded you okay now there are going to be issues don't be an enabler if he's got problems you got to be the helpmate say hey you got a problem you need to work on this and guys, don't you dare snuff back your wife because she's being a helpmate and she's calling you out on it, but you just want her to shut up and be quiet because you'll have reckonings with God because she's doing what she's called to do. She's going to protect the family. She's going to protect you the best that they know how to do. The, the, do things happen? Yes, guys. I don't know why things happen the way they do. And then he says, husbands, right? There's three verses that he gives the women. For the husband is the head of the wife. Also, Christ is the head of the church. Now watch this. When God created it, it went God, man, woman, family. When sin entered the world in our, in our man's class, we're learning this through the study that we're going through. Satan got to the woman that infected the man that was blasphemous to God. You see how the devil reversed it? You see how the sin and the fall reversed the order? So it always begins with the man. Why? God created who first? 
Adam. He created man to, to, to lead in that authority role. Now, it's like this. There's a general and a private, and all are in the army, and all care about the cause. All want to make the army strong, the nation safe. Correct? You agree with me on that? Those are all real things, but they all have different authorities. The general has a different authority than the private. But they're committed in there. So if it was God, Jesus submitted to God the Father, the Holy Spirit, right? Jesus went back and sent the Holy Spirit. There's an order to things. So God created man and then the woman. And so what he's saying is, you're all about the family. You're all about the marriage. You equally want the same thing. But understand at the end of the day, guess who's going to get judged for the family? The man. My theory is this. If I'm going to be judged before God, then I'm going to go down on my terms. That's just how I feel. So, okay, you know, but Yvette and I have this working relationship that we do. Like I ask her, what do you think about that? And she'll say, uh, I don't know. I'll wait. But if she says, you know, I don't have a read on that. Well, I sense that God's going to do this here. So she, and she'll say, you know what? I mean, Bob, you, you take that when you go with it. I'm just like, you know what? I'm good with that. We're going to do this. But there are times that I'll appeal to my wife. She says, ah, you, you probably ought not to do that. You need to wait on that. I listen to my wife. Now, she may argue with that, but she's in the nursery today, so she can't defend herself. There's no speakers back there, right? But this is a working relationship that we do. Listen, I have a heart for single women who raise their children. My mother raised four children, two sets of twins, a year and a half apart with one grandmother. So I, I have a heart for that out on the streets and I get that. It's difficult because, you know, you're just taking on so many hats. But in the original design of the family, that's why God put the man in there. He's the disciplinarian. He's the one that's going to kind of say, hey, the buck stops here. Don't talk to your mama that way. And get, girls, you should not disrespect your husband in front of your kids. You should never disrespect your husband anyway. Okay, just because you want to give him a piece of your mind, you might be wiser to hold your tongue, okay, and pray about it and see how God would have you approach it. So it's important in that passage. Husband, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself. Now, are you understanding this? First of all, you need to understand each one of those, man and woman, husband, wife, is said, as you love Christ. How many of you in here love Jesus Christ? None of you. All right, good. I'm, I'm in a missionary crowd. I got a lot of work to do. I'm changing to evangelism now. Okay, if you claim to love Jesus and you claim to have a relationship with Jesus and you claim to honor him, then listen, you need to live like that, okay? And so you live like that. You're doing everything for Jesus. Do you understand that? You're loving your husband for Jesus. You're building your family. You're a P31 woman. That means Proverbs 31. You're a P31 woman for Jesus. You're doing things for Jesus. If your husband doesn't get it, what's that got to do with anything? Because God's going to get him because you're doing it right. And so men, we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. How much did Christ love the church? Yeah. Yeah, you got to put it on the line. Now, that's a little bit deeper issue. You're like, oh, I'll die for my bride. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, well, die for your bride this way. Help her around the house. Maybe do the dishes, do the vacuuming, do the laundry. Okay, now I was very fortunate. I grew up with three sisters. I was Hinderella. And so for me, I had to do all those things. I used to make money ironing my sister's clothes when they would go to the dances. I could put creases, man, in anything. I can put creases in corduroy. I'm just good at what I do. And I made money off of it. Don't ask me to iron nothing. I'm retired. But see, the reality is that you're a team and that you're doing this together. Okay? I'm stronger with my wife. Now, I can do things by myself. I get that. But I don't want to. I don't want to do it that way. I've been 32 years working on this thing. I'm 56 years old. You know, I want to finish this thing well. I want to finish it right. I want to honor God. Anybody can throw relationships away. It's a dime a dozen nowadays, right? They don't even talk anymore. They just tweet. I don't like you. I'm done. Right? That's, that's how this culture kind of operates now. There's no conversation, no relationship. All right, singles, real quick, and then I got to get to this thing. We turn to the discussion to singles and the unmarried state. Now, I want you to get this. In the Old Testament times, singleness was rare among individuals old enough to marry. Those unmarried were therefore limited to widows, eunuchs, those who could not marry due to diseases such as leprosy 
or severe economic difficulties and those who did not marry because of some type of divine call. Paul was single. Jesus was single. Uh, those who had undergone a divorce or unmarried young men and women, marriage was the overwhelming norm in the Old Testament times in keeping with the foundational creational narrative in Genesis 1-2. Now, there were major figures, John the Baptist, Jesus, Paul, and Timothy were all unmarried in the Bible. Jesus spoke favorably about eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 19, 12. Paul even called celibacy a gift from God, 1 Corinthians 7, 7. So you honor God if you're single by being celibate. Now, you can't do it by yourself in today's culture. I mean, you can't even get out of the checkout stand in Walmart without half-naked pictures being put up in front of you. I mean, we have a serious lust problem in our culture and where we are. Okay, that's real. And so how do we protect young men from that? How do we protect ladies from that being looked at as just kind of objects? You know, uh, some commodity to buy, sell, and trade. You go up on 27, and we're almost leading the state now of kidnapped women. That I-27 corridor is an absolute nightmare. We ought to be praying for that every single day that Sheriff Judd busts those people that are shipping young girls. They are stealing kids in broad daylight now. They're running up, they're snatching them up, they're throwing them trailers, they're shipping them off of the sex trade. Pay attention to what's going on even around you. That, 20, that corridor is bad. The jogging women, stop jogging by yourself, ladies. Okay, all you are is a target. You know, and don't jog at night. For heaven's sake, I raised a daughter and I had three sisters. I was always fighting them about that stuff. You know, go with a friend, go with a buddy, go to a track, go to the gym. You know, and it's not as bad, probably worse than the gym sometimes, but go somewhere where it's safer than running out there by yourself. Tell your friends, protect them. Look at the culture that we're living in today. I mean, these little babies are absolutely getting kidnapped. It's just crazy. It's crazy. So the New Testament, you know, we have those stories of singleness and celibacy. And we see in the sweep of biblical history a trend from marriage as the norm with singleness being limited to exceptional cases to a place where the advantages and disadvantages of both marriage and singleness are affirmed in Jesus, the Apostle Paul, to a marriage less state in heaven, which we're all going to anyway. OK, we will only be married as the bride to Jesus. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I wanted to dive into the husband's love must be sacrificial, purposeful and personal. But I'm not going to do that today. Uh, the number one problem I believe here is with most men fail is the husband must submit to Christ's leadership. The problem is not that men don't do those things. The problem is that you're not really submitted to the Holy Spirit. When a man is submitted to the Holy Spirit and you have that relationship, guys, the reality is you will live for Jesus. If you try to live your life apart from him, you won't. And ladies, the beauty of the Bible is the prophet Isaiah said that Jesus Christ is your husband. Live to please him and you'll be fine. If God calls you to singleness, then be celibate. If God calls you to marriage, then listen, the marriage bed is undefiled. I don't care. You can swing from the chandelier if you want to. Okay. When you're married, then what you do is your business in that room. I don't want to know about it. I don't care. Don't ask me. Don't get opinions. I don't want to know. That's you. That's your married life. That's how you live your life. But you know what? Wherever you are today, honor God. That's all we're saying. Begin where you are today. Hey, guys, I want to say this. You may have felt like, you know, you didn't have the right role model and that didn't really work out for you. Or that you made so many mistakes, where do you begin? Or maybe that you just blew it so many times. And, and look, I've, I've been there. You know, I've been there. I, I've been through so many things in, in, in my lifetime. It's just incredible. You know, I'm thankful to God that God has stayed in the midst of my marriage and my family. It speaks to my soul. So I hope that you will enjoy this. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship, that we're in essence his masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't see a masterpiece, you know? I mean, maybe a, a Picasso, you know? But I wanna be a masterpiece. I wanna be everything that God has created me to be. And so I go to him in prayer and I say, God, do whatever it takes to, to get things out of my life that don't need to be there 
Mold me into the image of your son so that I can be your masterpiece. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God. <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah, yeah, you just said the prayer, so here I am. That's how it works. Oh, okay, okay. Um, if you're God, then make it snow in here. You know, if I made it snow in here, it'd get kind of yucky, and I really don't want to do that. See, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. Yes, I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. If you're God, what does Lamentations 15, 9 say? Lamentations is a very short book. It only has five chapters. Why is it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh. Yeah. Uh, if you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? You know what? I'm not so much into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. I gave it away. You answered my question with a question. I did? <laughs> yep, I do that. Don't I? I did it again. <laughs> Step right up. Here we go. Okay. okay? All right. Hey, yeah. um, what's this about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. Oh, yeah. okay. All right. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Here we go. Step okay. right up. Here we go. All right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Yeah. How do you know what to chisel and what to leave? I take out all the things in your life that aren't out of me, kind of like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of that, could you chisel right in here? I just can't get rid of it. I mean, the other went away, but this, I mean, I've tried exercising, I've watched what I ate, I even did Pilates for a while, that was awkward. But if you could chisel, all I mean, right. Can I talk or can I chisel? Talk, chisel, talk, chisel. No, talk, no, 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 chisel. chisel. All right, most of my children just like to talk. Not me. Bring on the chisel. Here we go. All right. You have a lot of anger. Ow. Some pride. Ow. Compare yourself to others instead of me. Ow. You're lazy. <clears throat> but you pretend like you're really, really busy. <clears throat> you have a problem with lust. No, okay. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> I do not have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it anytime I want. Okay. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Um. Maybe, maybe we could take a little time out. I mean, I think I'm doing pretty good. You are doing good, but when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and others need to see my son. Here we go. <sighs> okay, hold on, hold on. Um, don't take this the wrong way. It's just that when I start looking more like your son, um, people get uncomfortable around me, you know? I mean, even my friends at church, they're all like, oh, you're holier than thou, why won't you do that, you know? I mean, so what you're doing right now is you rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. I did not say that. That's what you meant. Yes, it is. It's hard to talk to you. I mean, you know everything I'm thinking. I'm just saying, you've done good work. Maybe we take a little break, a little time out, then we'll come back to right? it. What you're doing right now is so common. What you're doing right now is called control. Do you want to control things in your life, or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, No, no, chisel. chisel. Here we go. No, can, can we chisel where I want that? It's called control. Okay. You've been holding on to this for a long time. You ready for this? Yeah. <clears throat> it hurts. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. <clears throat> Ow! I don't think you understand this pain. Don't talk to me about pain. I know all about pain. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin, but I also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting different results. And there are the things in your life, you even think back to high school that you've been doing that do not work in your life, but you go to these empty wells whenever you're hurting, whenever you're angry, whenever you're lonely and tired, but they do not work. No, 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 okay, okay. Um, I'm thinking maybe Your we thoughts could... thoughts are not my thoughts. Oh, okay, but if we went another way... Your we ways could... are not my ways. Okay, well, look, I can't be good. You can't be good. I've made you good. Be good. Uh, uh, what? Nothing. What is it? No, you wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just, God, I've let you down so many times. No, you were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand, and don't you forget that. In this relationship, I hold you up. Okay. Chisel away. All right. But just, just be prepared for what you're going to find in there, because I know who's inside there. Because God, I get up every morning and I look at him in the mirror. And it is this, this scared little kid 
who gets up every day and tries to dress like an adult and act like an adult, but I can't. So just be prepared for what you're going to find in there. You have listened to so many voices for far too long that are not of me. You think you're junk, don't you? You really, really, really think you're junk. Listen to me. I don't make junk. What does that say about me? How can I show you that my love for you has no boundaries? I know. Reach in your back pocket. What? Reach in your back pocket. Why? Are you arguing with me? Reach in your back pocket. God. Yes? I was just saying, God, I'll do that right now. You were just saying my name in vain. You know what? It's, it's a name. It's a saying. It's, it's more it's... than a name. It's more than a saying. It's more than a bad habit. It's a name above all names. I want to teach you something about my name. Reach in your back pocket. You know what that is? This is a page from, from a journal I had when I was younger. How'd you get this? Hello? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, read it. I love Angie Holland. The other side. Sorry. I married her. I was there. Oh, oh yeah. Dear God, today I am turning everything over to you. I'm not going to hold on to anything anymore. Your word says that you will make me your masterpiece and use me to do great things. I don't see how it's possible, but I want that with all that I am. So please do whatever it takes to make me what you want. I love you, God. I love you too, Tommy. And I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. So this salvation that you hold, don't let it be some sentimental gush or some head knowledge. I want you to work it out in every detail of your life. And don't compare yourself to someone else because that is just trivial nonsense. You are my original masterpiece. You are one of my workmanship and you I find favor. This, don't look at this as a prison, but look at this as a, a father disciplines his child. A father disciplines the ones he loves. I know, but it's gonna be tough. Yes, it'll be tough. But you bought into the lie thinking everything was going to be easy when you said yes to me. It's not how it works. I want you to do something. I want you to look up there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy. No, 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 no. Not the way you see yourself or you yearn so much for others to see you. But the way I see you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. God doesn't make junk. You are an original masterpiece.